Okay, this is um, arguably one of the most important chapters to understand, which is instantaneous rates of change. And it's important because it leads into pretty much all of calculus, what calculus is looking at. If you look at something that is uh, upside down, parabola, as I've pointed out before, the rate of change here is positive and slowly gets uh, less, and over here it is uh, negative as it heads down. But the point is the rate of change anywhere on this curve is different. And it's very hard to measure uh, the rate of change, like what that slope is, at that point, at any point I'm interested in. And one of the few ways, graphically, <coughs> to do it, pardon me, you see the red dot is what I'm talking about, is to try to draw a tangent. You can even see that my tangent line isn't quite 90 degrees to the thing I'm trying to study. There, it's probably close there. And it's very hard to do that. And I mean, it only works if I have a graphic. It doesn't work if I just have the numbers in here and I'm working with just the numbers. It only works if I have a graphic. And then, then and only then can I take the slope of that triangle to figure out its uh, rise and its run. And we can see it's negative here because the rise is actually going down and the run is going that way. Uh, can I get an idea of the rate of change at that one point? However, mathematically, algebraically, if I just look at that point, which is this point here, I have no way of coming up with a formula to figure out the slope of the tangent. And you might say, why, why, why? Let's skip why for a second. Let's just uh, look at the reason, what we're aiming for, which is rate of change. And I can tell you briefly why, 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 because it impacts on every field, economics, biology, uh, uh, finances, investments, populations, uh, culture. How quickly something is changing impacts on how it will behave in the future. If you have 10 people in the room, the party is going to be very different than when we add 90 more. So rate of change is, is really important for so many future issues, including climate change. I mean, we're seeing rate of change and climate change accelerating right now, and still people can't admit it. So. One thing, another reason for studying these things is data. Data and, and analysis is one of the few ways to come up with a real conclusion. And I'm sure you lived through the pandemic and you heard everybody talking and they had a lot of anecdotal opinions. A good example is no one I know got sick, therefore there is no virus. Well, that's foolish and they don't have the data. They're looking at the five people they know, and they're using, the, let's say you know more, let's say you know 20 people directly, and they're using that to draw conclusions about 7.5 billion people. Well, that's impossible. And statistics and math and everything shows us you need a bigger sample group, and that's why science when they're doing these analysis about a virus and how dangerous is it, it, it is, they look at 2,000, 2 million, 20 million. They look at millions of data points before they make a conclusion, is this virus dangerous? And I think you'll even remember in the beginning, people were saying, oh, it's sort of like the flu. And then as more people were dying, Italy specifically, when Italy had people flooding the, has the hospitals and they had too many ill people to treat, extra people died and that's when they went whoa we don't have enough hospital beds we got to slow this thing down we might have approached it differently if we had 7.5 million hospital beds billion hospital beds right we had a hospital bed for every human on the planet which isn't practical and would cost us millions in taxes individually each year but it wouldn't be a problem we could say yeah we'll we'll just go to the hospital if someone gets sick but the, the truth is you got 75 billion people and maybe 700,000 hospital beds. Uh, and that's probably no way, you know, it's way more than that. It's like 70 million. But still, we're talking about 1,000 or 10,000 to 1 ratio, which means for every 10,000 people, I have one hospital bed because I don't expect everyone to get sick at once. My, But the big point I'm making is you can only draw conclusions from data and you can only analyze data if you have the right tools and that's why we are looking at things like calculus 
in algebra because it leads to stronger and stronger data. Don't fall in the trap of believing that because you have an anecdotal experience, your data is valid. I use this all the time. I have never seen an elephant. Therefore, pardon my spelling, elephants don't exist. You can see right away how foolish that is. Well, it's the same logic. You cannot draw a conclusion like I've just written without a lot more data. I would have to see, ask everybody if they've seen an elephant, right? And then I would have to ask if their opinion is valid. Right? I could, you, there's people who have said they've seen aliens. doesn't make it true. So you have to ask enough people to find out if maybe it's true. Um, so we're, st we're stuck with the impossible thing of trying with our current mathematical knowledge, figuring out the slope the tangent line at any point, and that's the point I want to be able to measure the instantaneous rate of change. How fast is that point right there where I'm clicking going down? And I can't do that with my current alge uh, algebra. W what I can do is I can say, okay, well, I have this point here that I'm interested in, and I happen to have, and I happen to have data. So this, let's say, this is the point I'm interested in. And I happen to have the data point here, and I happen to have the data point here, and I happen to have the data point here, and the data point here. And I can uh, actually probably up here, visually, you can see it better. And let's say I have the data point here, data point here, data point here, and I'm interested in that one. Well, I can draw, as we've been doing, average rate of change between on either side of that point. And I can look at the slope of this black line and say, Huh, that's probably close to this. And then I can get even tighter. I can say, oh, I've got two points even closer. I can take that that line and get, that looks pretty damn close to what I'm looking at. So I can get an approximation with our current algebra. And that's what we're learning here, is to get our average rate of change closer and closer to that point on either side. So that first, this distance between that point is one x distance. You know, we're mostly looking at the x distance. It's one x distance between those two points. Until I get closer and closer to like 0.1 x distance, 0.001 x distance, 0.0001 x distance. And I'm trying to get closer and closer on either side of that dot to measure it. And you might say, why don't I just do a, a, a rate of change for that dot of loan? Well, you don't have enough data. With just this one dot, you can't take a slope. You can't take this and divide it by that. That doesn't tell you anything. It does not tell you slope. To get a slope of any line, you need two points, right? So the only thing we can do right now is get closer and closer to that point. And so essentially, if I'm looking at an x value here, let's just focus on the x value of 5. Oh, well, let's stick with where I am. Minus uh, 7.5, let's say that is right there. And I look here at minus 9. Let's say I look here at minus 9, and I look here at minus 6. So let's say I draw the point there. It's a pretty big gap, but if I can suddenly, instead of seven, 9 to 7.5, if I can find a point that's minus 7.4 and minus 7.6, I'm going to get much more accurate information because I'm very close to minus 7.5. And ultimately, we're going to learn something called h. And h is that I'm just going to take that number that I'm interested in minus 7.5 and I'm going to create one that's right beside it 7.5 plus a tiny distance called H and I'm gonna make that H as small as I can because when I am just a small distance from this I'm gonna get the most accurate slope so keep that in mind the idea is we're getting smaller and smaller from the actual point we're interested in until we actually start using a fictional distance called H and this chapter covers two things it covers looking at the instantaneous rate of change right beside two points. It asks you to take the long rate of change, and then it asks you to take a shorter and shorter. So if you look at this, they're interested in 6.4, so right here. So the best thing we have based on this data is to find the rate of change between, you might say, between this one and this one. It's sort of true and it's sort of not. What you would want to do is find the rate of change between this one and this one, and then find the rate of change between this one and this one and then find the rate of change between this one and which, that one, because those are all the closest data points. And then what do you do with all those rates of change? Take an average, or try to see if they're approaching a number. 
because if the rate of change between this one and this one is 3.5, and this one and this one's 3.001 and 3.001 between this one, I can kind of conclude that 3.5 isn't as accurate. I'm trying to approach 3. So what they take you through with practice is calculate the average rate of change between several dots to sort of see how accurate your instantaneous rate of change would be, which means how accurate are you getting to the actual rate of change at 6.4. And then they always give definitions like this in the border. And right now we're stuck with taking a, a guesstimate, and here they go. We, we just create a fake X and we call it A, and we're trying to find two A's that are close to each other. We'll get more into that. Don't get too hung up on that. So a preceding interval is look at the slope of two dots just to the left of it. So here they're giving a population and they're using a formula. Well, the nice thing about formulas is we can plug in data into the formula. We can plug in random numbers for T and come up with our population. So this is population based on time, and it starts at 2,000. And they're asking us to find the uh, interval, the rate of change, between 14 and 15. Well, that means you would plug in 14 into this t up here. You would calculate 1.5 to the power of 14, and you multiply by 35,000 to come up with the y value for that. Then you would plug in 14 for the t, which is the x value, into it and do it again. Then you would do a delta y, delta x. Essentially, in this case, it's delta population and delta time. And they come up with the rate of change in that particular interval is this fast. Now, that's generally a um, an average. It's an average rate of change. And we're trying to, if you look at it, estimate the instantaneous rate of change exactly. They want exactly 2015. So we're looking at the one before. So what do you think we should look at after that? We should look at the one even closer. They're going to want us to get closer. So now then they take 15, but they take 14.5. So they're getting as close to 15 as they can. So this one was 3464, and this one comes to 3506. Then they're asking us to look at the one after 16 and 15, and we can see it's 3639. And then they're asking us to take one a little bit closer that's after. And they're calling that the following interval. So you're, you're essentially looking, what I did, is you're looking at a dot. You take If you're interested in this dot, you're taking the slope from this dot to that dot, and this dot to that dot. And then that's the following interval. And then you're taking the slope, or the average change, from this dot to that dot, and this dot to that dot, by plugging it into the formula over and over again. As an example, and actually that's okay, we won't do examples, because the book has plenty of examples. And then they're asking you to take, to look at it, and what you do is you take the average of those slopes. So I'm going to take the one that was really close on the right side, the following interval, and the really close one on the left side, the preceding interval, I'm going to add them together and divide it by two. So I'm taking an average. Anytime you take an average, you could take the average of all four, too. You're allowed to take averages with numbers that are bigger than one. For instance, if I know that uh, someone scored 70% in class and someone scored 80% in class, I can know the average between those two people is 75, which is 80 plus 70 divided by 2. However, if I then find out two other people's scores, that somebody had a score of 50 and someone else had a score of 81, if I want to find the average of these four scores, I would take all four of them, add them together, and divide by 4. So you can see you can take averages. The 4 is the number of terms you're using, and the, f the actual values are the top. And once you get this, I'm getting a far more accurate idea of what the class average is than when I was just taking two people. Two people is not going to tell me. And of course, if I get everyone's class average, I get the exact class average. But sometimes science is about only taking a few until you get close enough to that exact number to use it for judgment. Okay, let's go on. Uh, then they ask you to uh, take a centered interval. In this case, we're interested in P15, right? So they're taking the uh, the slope from P16 to P14, which is mean, it, which is on either side of it exactly by one. So 15 is right in the middle of 16 and 14, and then they're finding the slope, and they came up with 3552 doing that. 
Then they do it again with two points on either side that are exactly the same distance, 0.5 away from 15, but closer, and they're getting more exact. You can see it's 35550. The average, by the way, came up with 35550 as well, so we're getting an idea of pretty accurate. The average rates of change are very similar. Make an estimate using the smallest centered interval. Well, this one is much more accurate because the dots are closer. And that's what they're asking you to do, is practice walking before you run and understand what's going on. So the volume of, of a cubic crystal, so this is a volume formula, and volume is always three dimensions, so you can do length times width times height. And they give it to you. And they ask, estimate the instant rate of change when the volume on the side of its side length is five. So by the way, this is a cubic, a crystal, so it's exactly a cube, which has equal sides, length, height, and width. And so they're asking you to look at the interval between this and that. Well, let's have a look. Let's just let Desmos do that. We're going to do f of x is equal to x cubed and its volume. So we're only interested in values of x that are bigger or equal to zero, because volume, sorry, bigger or equal to zero, because volume can only be positive. So that's what it does. It kind of looks like a parabola. And if you remember without this, it's actually like that. So they're curious about the rate of change when the volume is 125. Well, if I find the rate of change when the volume is 4.5, which is 0.5 to the left, and the volume when it's 5.5, which is 0.5 to the right, I'm using a centric interval. And then I can take the slope between those lines which is the distance between 5.5 on the y value, which is the y value, divided by, and what? how much apart was I? I was 5.5 minus 4.5 on the x value, which is 1. But I want you to notice that it's 1, and you can see that it's 1 when you purposely took these points. So it's clear that you can take any distance you want. And we can see that the rate of change, the slope, which I've called m, is 75 upwards, so it's growing at 75 meters cubic per, well, geez, how would I, per meter of increase in the length, because x represents x, y, uh, the length, width, and height, either one. So you can see the volume is increasing at 75 meters cubic per each increase of, per one increase of its side length or height. Um, now look, you can get even more specific. What if instead I took not 4.5, but what's a number that's right close to 5? 4.9, right? And then I can take what's the equidistance on the other side of it? 5.1. How far between 4.9 and 5.1? It's 0.2, isn't it? Well, you can see I don't have to do the x, y anymore. I can just take a distance that I want. And again, I got to do 5.1 and 4.9. And we can see I'm getting much closer, it's 75.01. So you might say ah, it's the same thing. It actually got worse. But you'll see in other examples that we can get closer and closer, the smaller point I look. Now obviously look, I could take 5.99 um, and that would be 5.001. And then so long as I put this into there, 001 accurately, 99, and divide it by the correct amount, we're now distance by Oh, one, you can see I got, that's the, mm, did I get it right? I don't think I did. Divided by, I'm going to just take the subtraction instead to be accurate, 5.001. Yeah, sorry, it's not 001, it's 002, which makes a difference. There, there I got the accurate thing. And by the way, the, the subtraction between that was 0.002, not 0.001, which is why I was coming up with that. It's a big difference when you divide by 2 and divide by uh, 1. See, watch what happens. See, it doubles. So, um, But you can see I'm getting very, very close to the number 75, right? And that's what they're trying to teach you. And then eventually, we're just going to call this a letter H. We're going to use any interval we want. We're going to look at the precise interval we want. And we're just going to call this 5 plus the point 001. And I'm jumping ahead here. And just f of 5. And we're going to get to very, very accurate numbers and make sure this matches this. 
and it doesn't yeah I've had uh, I might as well just add a zero there you can see we can get very very accurate numbers and eventually we're just coming closer and closer to 75 so they do it here they use the centric interval and they come up with 75.25 and then they use a closer centric interval and they come up with 75.02 then they click they do exactly what I did they could take a really close centric interval and they come up with something it's clear it's approaching 75 they make the conclusion it's 75 and here's where they introduce the difference quotient so instead of constantly doing x2 minus x1 at the bottom you can just take the distance that you want between those two points you can just say I'm gonna take let's just stick with point one because it's easier to take say I'm gonna take point one on either side and you, and you might say well that's not on either side well if you want I can just do five uh, minus point one and five plus point one but it gets kind of pointless after a while five minus point plus point one and the difference between that is point two and you can see I get fairly accurate but the more smaller I make what's called this H distance between them the more accurate my 75 gets right so this is just adding an h value anything I want and this is just adding the same h value and this is just two times the h value that I'm adding up above but eventually you can skip this part of it entirely and just look at 5 plus 0 0.01 minus the 5 out of 5 and just use this as your the h value you've added here and it be eventually becomes f of 5 plus h minus f of 5 and you're still going to get a very accurate idea of slope especially the more I make this let's just call it h let's just call it h and h and we're supposed to have a slider here let's call h is equal to 0 0.0001 and look depending on what I make my h that thing gets less and less and then more and more accurate right smaller I make H look how quickly it it's approaching 7.0000 and you might say how come it's going up afterwards it's because I'm using plus H here minus um, F of 5 <coughs> and I'm actually slightly on the left of slightly on the right of F of 5 but we'll get into that as well but my point is understand how we get to here is they kind of in this chapter just jump and they notice they use f of a instead of f of x that's so that you're not obsessed with uh, delta x anymore that you're looking at you're taking any point you're adding an h to that point and you might say well how do I do that well if you have the formula and you're looking at f of 5 you just choose your h any h you want and you put 5.001 and you plug it into your formula which is pretty much what they're doing here they're plugging 4.99 into the formula to get 125.75. Now, this is an algebraic, and they're showing that they're showing you how to do it algebraically and how to come up with that. And let me show that to you too, because this is important in calculus to be able to understand this. If I'm interested in this curve, and I'm interested in when x is 5, when x is 5. So we don't know the why. Let's suppose I have a formula, and it doesn't matter what it is, okay? And then I take an h distance away from that. So I'm just going to go h distance. It doesn't matter what the h is. I'm going to look at a point right here called x is equal to 5.00, oh, 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 sorry, 5 plus h. Okay, so that's my second point. The formula for slope is delta y minus delta uh, divided by delta x. Right? But if you look at delta y, we've discovered it's just 1 f of x plus 0 0.001 right? minus 1 f of x either minus 0 0.001 or whatever. But if we're doing it this way, let's just put it in as h. We're looking at f of x plus h minus f of x. What would the uh, x values down be at the be at the bottom? Well, the x values at the bottom, the right hand, the x2 is x plus h minus x. 
Well, let's resolve that. What's x plus h minus x? Well, the x's cancel, and we're left with h. So algebraically, you can see that you can come up with this formula, and it helps if you use a specific value. So for instance, we used 5, right? So I'm doing, so I'm doing f of x f of oh. I'm doing f of x plus h minus f of x and at the, oh I'm sorry I'm, the whole point is using 5 and that's going to create the slope between 5 and a point that's h to the right of 5 and down below I'm using x2 which is f x 5 plus h minus 5 and we've already discovered that these cancel out, 5 minus 5, and left up top. And that's how they come up with it, with a specific value of x, which we were just doing. And this is important because in calculus, eventually, what you're going to do is you're going to have the actual formula. Let's take that further. And you can skip this next part and just go ne next straight to the questions. But suppose you have x to the 2. I'll keep it simple. So what is f of 5 going to be? Well, f of 5 is obviously going to be 25. So that means we have a, a 5, 25 coordinate. OK, what's f of x plus h going to be? Huh, well, that's going to be x plus h squared. Right, I'm not going to do the squared. But that's going to be x squared plus 2xh. And this is calculus, pretty much, we're getting into. But it's important to see it, plus h squared. So again, this, this squared here and the squared is here. And also this squared here is up above. OK, which means that if I replace my f of x plus h, oh, sorry. Oh, well, I sorry, I could even do it with 5. Sorry, we were doing it with 5, right? So now let's look at what that is for 5. It is. Five plus h squared, and I won't do the squared, which is twenty-five. Plus what's two times five? Ten h plus h squared. There we were doing it five, and then of course, what's the x value? The x value is x plus h. So we're talking about the coordinates, and this is where it gets sticky. The coordinates is x plus h. Sorry, five plus h. I keep doing that. 25 plus, and the y coordinates, 25 plus h plus h squared. Then if I do the delta y of delta x for this, so this is my y2, and I, I might as well label them so you can see them, because it helps to make the connection with slopes, and that's my x2, and that's my x1 here, and that's my y1. If I do a simple delta, y minus delta x, which is pretty easy for you to do. There's my y2 minus my y1. There's my y1, right? Okay, let's just do the delta y first. So we're doing delta y, delta y divided by delta x. Okay, what is my delta x? Well, it's this, 5 plus h. minus my h, which is 5, right? What's 5 plus h minus 5? So it's all divided. 5 plus h minus 5, we've already discovered, is h. And what's my 25 plus 10h plus h squared? That's h squared, by the way. Might as well replace it. h squared minus 25. Well, it's clear that these 25s cancel out. And this should be like that, not like that. And can't I uh, take an H out of both of those? Yes, I can. I'm left with 10 plus H divided by H. My H is cancel. And my rate of change at 5 for this formula will be plus 10 plus 
h and h I'm trying to get closer and closer to 0 so it's clear that it's going to be 10 this is calculus this is six months in one second and this is why they're walking you through the slow steps to understand rate of change so then they give you some examples they give you some data and they ask you to counter late count figure out the intervals and and they're phrasing things in terms of x now instead of y so that you can understand how to take the next step and reach calculus and then they summarize it and they make sure you understand that you're looking at a range between one point that is h lower and they're using minus h you can use plus h or minus h and then another point that is oh yeah they're, they're teaching you what the preceding interval is and what the following interval is without actually using numbers they're using a for as a random value of x and they're using h and the preceding interval is h lower and the following interval is h higher the reason they do this is to teach you how you're reaching instantaneous rate of change you're essentially taking average rate of change of dots that are closer and closer check your understanding so they just want you to practice and believe me practice is the key listening to me is not the key practice is the key So, um, 5x squared plus minus 7, I'm just going to let the, I should probably leave that there. Eh? So I'm going to use 5x squared, f of x is equal to 5x squared minus 7. And I'll just turn that off. And this allows you to figure out. So they want delta x, they want the delta f of x, and they want the delta x. Well, this is easy to figure out the delta x. What's 2 minus 1.9? Right here. Sorry, it takes me so long to type. There we go. 2 minus 1.9 is clearly equal to 0 0.1. So that's essentially the delta x or h for that one. What is my difference between this one? 2 minus 1.99. And that, of course, is equal to 0 0.01. So you can see they're trying to make that difference smaller and smaller. Then they want you to calculate um, the f of 2 minus the f of 1.9. So I'm going to just let this do it. Oh, I'm going to keep this around actually because it's going to let me calculate. I'm just going to add some extra expressions. Okay, I'm going to calculate my f of 2 and I'm going to calculate my f of what was it? Uh, 1.9 and then I'm going to skip the h part of this formula and I'm just going to put in my difference. I'm going to call it difference and I'm going to put in f of 2 minus f of 1.9. And there you can see it gives me my value, 1.95. So that's my delta y between f of 2 and f of 1.9. And then what do you do to figure out this, the rate of change? You take your delta f of x and you divide it by your delta x. So I'm going to let Desmos do that for me as well. And I'm going to let it do it with this formula. I'm going to call it m instead of delta, and I'm going to take d and divide it. d was the delta y, I figured it out. And actually, I, could, I should just add uh, a row in there that lets me do all my deltas, right? Put it up there and make my, let's call this uh, y, y3. So the difference, we'll call delta y, y3. And we'll call delta x, y, x3. And it's going to be equal to f of 2 minus f of 1.9. Oh, no, just 2. Delta x is just 2 minus 1.9. Okay. So now I've let uh, Desmos calculate my difference between my x values. 
and then I've let Desmos calculate my difference, uh, my delta y between y values, and now I'm going to let it calculate my rate of change by taking y3 and dividing it by x3, and it's going to come up with 19.5. So that's when I take 1.95 and divide it by 0.1. So it came up with 19.5. So that means my delta for this one, my average rate of change between that point was this. I don't know where it came up with the dollar values. Is that. Then when I do it for this one, 2 and 1.9, it's even easier. Because I can just do 2. I can just do 1.9 here. I can just do 1.9 here. And I can just do 1.9 here, and it's going to calculate it for me right away. Uh, oh, I didn't do 1.9 here. I did 1.9. Oh, that, that makes a difference. And there's my M now, 19.55. Now, it unfortunately didn't calculate these ones for me. So that's 8.75 divided by 0.5, right? So it helps to see those as well. What's 8.75 divided by 0.5? Seventeen point five, and what's the one up above? Up above? Well, it's fifteen divided by one, which is fifteen. Now, what number am I getting closer and closer to? Notice that this gap is the biggest up here. This gap's the biggest, and produced the most inaccurate number. This gap's closer, and it's getting closer. But notice these really small ones here are getting very close. And this one especially. What number do you think I'm approaching as I go down this list? Twenty. So it's clear that my instantaneous rate of change for the area I'm interested in, which is 2, is probably 20, which means it's probably changing 20 y values, 20 units of y for every one value of x, which is what rate of change is, at that specific spot. There we go. Now, I'm going to have to take a little break here. So this is sort of the intro, and then I'll do the questions later.